you eat animals, you're eating corn. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to our uh, little festival uh, of the of to our festival of festivities that meets weekly. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. The second, we'll then have a uh, our speaker will speak up to about an hour, and then uh, we'll have a question and answer period after that. And then after the question and answer period, we'll have rebuttals. Um, after the rebuttals, we generally wrap up about nine o'clock, but I'll keep the Zoom call open for quite a while if we need to do so, you know, until we want to chat afterwards. So with that, Charlie, if you're ready, I'll uh, start the announcements. If anybody else has any announcements that are good to the community, uh, let me know and uh, we'll get started. So with that, oh. uh, Charlie, go ahead and uh, get started. I'll... Uh, you know, read the book right. Tomato Land. Okay, anyway, right. book Tomato Land. All right. get, go ahead, Welcome Charlie. Welcome to meeting number 3651 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Three things from three business issues. Uh, we have an email uh, Google group, which you are all invited to become a member of very little traffic. We also have a Yahoo group, which functions in the same fashion, one or two notices a week. You mean meetup group? Open, then the next open dates are April 2nd. Uh, we also are looking for an Earth Day speaker and a May Day speaker. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming program. <laughs> On February the 5th, Ken Williams will be looking at the Democratic Party and what it needs to do to counter the Republican efforts uh, against democracy. Should be good program. I've seen it already. On the 12th, the Illinois Green Party, to which I am affiliated, will be here to talk about various campaigns and progress, uh, referendums and so forth. How to do one in your locale. On the 19th, Stanfield Smith will be coming back to tell us about the war, the US war on Venezuela. That's for sure. On the 26th of February, we're gonna be getting into transportation and we have an academic, an author who's gonna be talking about the automobile industry and the concept of self-driving cars. We can get into a car and play a game of Pinochle, allegedly. On March the 5th, Dan Waterstrad is here tonight. We'll be talking about the urgency to maintain purity of food and water. Uh, he's got a number of links there. He has provided as homework to watch in advance. On March the 12th, We'll be going back to this time. We'll be talking about the war on Nicaragua, Los Sandinistas, and the efforts to keep the people from going down the shining path of socialism, El Camino Luminoso. On March the 19th, this should be an interesting one. We have an author who's, who's put together a memoir of his various activities and adventures, and has also written a manifesto. Uh, he's got the first chapter he's provided there, if you'd like to get a taste of that program. On March the 26th, Dan Lee will be returning with another well-researched program, and she'll be discussing how there we live in a world of a yin-yang dynamism. Don't miss that one. I'm heading into April, April the 9th, the One Earth Collective. We all reside on one earth. You may not know that, folks, but the One Earth Collective will be here at the college to discuss their various activities. They're putting together a film program. On the 16th, we're talking about, oh my, where are we going to get where are we going to get electricity? We'll look at the world of hydrogen. Uh, what is the role 
it might play in arriving at net zero carbon economy. Uh, good program. And then we head into the 30th and yours truly, it's gonna, it's National Arbor Day. I'll be talking about how, why we should preserve the forest and that for remaining forest, remnant forest, I call them in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And for the primitive species uh, that uses it as their habitat. There's some videos uh, that were there. And lastly, as I said, getting it to May, we're looking for a May Day speaker. May the 2nd is the next open date. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. Take it away. Okay, anybody else have announcements for the good of the uh, college real quick before I turn it over to our speakers? I just wanted to ask Charles about that last picture about the April 29th, I think it was. Uh, what was in the greenery behind that girl? Was that a person or an animal? Well, take a look at it. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Uh, the, you you, you I, stand it over it too a, fast. It was a Halloween well, cat. Go back and look at it. I, yeah, so I it was a Halloween cat. There's videos there. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, okay, now that we've got that out of the way, anybody else have announcements for the good of the order? Okay, let's uh, introduce our speaker tonight, mm -hmm. our, our uh, main speaker, who is um, for coming from the Coalition of Inoculi Workers, the Fair Food Program, Anti-Slavery Program, and Boycott Wendy's. If you want to go right ahead, uh, let's mute. Remember to everybody mute themselves while the program is going on. And uh, uh, if you're ready to start speaking, uh, go ahead and let's get underway. Okay, thank you, Tim. Hold on just a second. We're going to just get started with sharing our screen and then we can get started with the presentation. Um, if you can give me a quick thumbs up if you can see that. Okay. Okay. Entonces, yo creo que estamos listos. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well. Mm -hmm. Buenas noches a todos y gracias por darnos esta oportunidad de estar aquí con ustedes en esta noche. Y pues nosotros vamos a hablar un poquito de la historia, del, del trabajo que nosotros hacemos y, y de Wendy's también, como lo mencionó ahí en este día. Y mi nombre es Silvia Sabanía. So first of all, good evening to all of you. Thank you all so much for giving us this uh, time and the space to talk a little bit about our work that we do here with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Um, as Tim mentioned, we're gonna talk about what, what is it that we do, what, what is the main purpose of our organization, and then sort of finalize it with around our campaign, specifically our Wendy's campaign. My name is Silvia Savania, and I'm a farm worker and staff member with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And I'm Uriel, and I'm gonna be interpreting for Silvia today. Así es que buenas noches, así es que como estamos viendo esta foto que está ahí, pues nosotros como trabajadores del campo agrícola es nuestra herramienta, es una cubeta de piscar en los tomates. Eh, en los años 90, pues había mucho, no solamente en los años 90, sino que en los años atrás también que había mucho lo que era el robo de salario, la esclavitud moderna, eh, lo que es el acoso sexual más que nada para las mujeres. Entonces, Era eso del, del problema que se había tanto. Entonces, donde hubo uh, que muchos de los trabajadores se reunieron para resolver estos problemas y mayormente trabajadores inmigrantes que eran de Guatemala, de México, de Haití, que eran, son los trabajadores que mayormente trabajan en el campo. Yeah, so to start off with uh, of our work, we're, we're going to use this image that you see on your screen right now. So... This image is an image of a farm worker um, here in our Immokalee community with the main tool of the farm worker here, which is that <clears throat> bucket, which holds about 32 pounds of tomatoes when it's full. Um, back in the 90s, specifically 1993, when CIW was founded, um, farm workers were facing all sorts of abusive human rights abuses and just labor rights abuses in the workplace. Now, when we talk about these abuses, we're talking about things like physical and verbal abuse, systematic wage theft um, for that work, for farm worker women, instances of sexual harassment and sexual violence, and in some of the most extreme cases, cases 
of what we call forced labor or modern day slavery, right? And that had been happening in agriculture for decades before, but that's kind of the context by which the coalition uh, was sort of formed. Um, now, most of the farm workers that do this work in the actual fields are for the most part migrant workers, uh, people who come from other countries, specifically countries like Guatemala, Mexico, and Haiti, um, and who then come here to this country to work in the agricultural industry, toiling um, in the fields. And so given this context, the Immokalee workers began to organize to see what can we do to address these issues that we're facing. Entonces, uh, pues los trabajadores uh, luchaban de las malas condiciones que uno enfrenta en los, en los campos. Especialmente, le digo por mi experiencia que yo trabajé más de 16 años en los campos que mirábamos a los contratistas que nos maltrataban. No podías llevar tu cubeta uh, vacía, o sea, muy copeteada porque no te daba tu, tu ticket, lo que nos pagaba durante el día. Y te gritaban de lejos. Entonces era el maltrato que siempre recibíamos eh, de durante todos esos años. Gracias a la organización de la coalición de trabajadores de Imocali, se organizaron todos los trabajadores para poder ver estos cambios, de hacer estas huelgas, de, de parar los paros laborales, que fueron una semana de 500 trabajadores de no ir a trabajar para poder parar estos uh, abusos que enfrentábamos con los rancheros. Yeah, and so, and I can tell you firsthand as a farm worker who has worked in agriculture for 16 years, that this is pretty much um, the, the, the given in terms of the kind of conditions that farm workers face. For example, a farm worker by simply not filling up that bucket to a standard, um, to whatever standard or all the way to the top, You'll have a crew leader and a supervisor screaming at you, not counting that bucket, taking the bucket, but not counting it towards the amount of buckets that you pick or screaming at you and telling you to go back into the field and fill it up correctly. Um, and so, again, because of this context, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers came into existence and began to organize far farm workers on how to address these issues. And the first types of actions that the coalition started to do was work stoppages, like the image that you see here, where farm workers, hundreds of farm workers, in this specific instance that you're seeing your screen, 500 farm workers decided to not go to the fields, to not go to work, to not get in those buses that take them to the farms, unless those farms started treating them better in the workplace. Así es, entonces para, en ese tiempo que se hizo las huelgas, no, se hizo marchas también hasta los, uh, hasta en los trabajadores de, de todos los, los trabajadores que trabajaban para poder subir el sueldo porque ellos querían bajar el, el precio de la cubeta. Nosotros nos pagan por pieza de cubeta. En ese tiempo se pagaba 35 centavos y nosotros queríamos que lo subiera. Entonces ellos, los rancheros, querían pagar 30 centavos. Entonces de hacer estas huelgas, también huelgas de hambre, marchas, de todo lo que se, se podía hacer para poder subir ese precio de la cubeta, se dieron, la, los rancheros se dieron de pagar un poquito más, pero siempre, siempre tenemos que hacer con los trabajadores es marchar, hacer esto, porque a los contratistas igual golpeaban a los trabajadores. Solo el problema de ir a tomar agua, que también como trabajador uno se cansa y tiene que tomar agua. Entonces el contratista le pegó, le golpeó a este trabajador. Este trabajador vino caminando desde el rancho hasta la coalición para decir que lo había golpeado este contratista. Y ese mismo tarde se, se usó su camisa que tenía sangre de este trabajador y hacer esa marcha hasta en su casa del contratista para declarar que golpear a uno es golpear a todos. Yeah, and, and so the main topic or the main sort of reason for taking these actions were to better wages, to eliminate physical abuse, to just again, create a better workplace for farm workers. Um, these work stoppages happened specifically at that time because farm workers were getting paid at that time in the 1990s, about 35 cents for a 32 pound bucket of tomatoes. And some farms wanted to cut the 35 cents to 30 cents, right? And so 
that was the main reason for this strike to, to take place, demanding that they don't cut, cut the wages to this, to this already grueling and demanding job. On top of that, there were hunger strikes. Um, again, uh, six farm workers uh, going uh, on a hunger strike for 30 days with the context again of eliminating abuses. But specifically, there was an instance where a 16 year old farm worker from Guatemala actually stopped to work and, and went to drink water. Um, when he did this, the crew leader didn't like that he did this without his permission and physically assaulted the 60 year old farm worker, um, uh, beating him until he was bloodied. Um, this farm worker then came to the CIW offices, completely covered in blood in his shirt. And then later that night, uh, over, 500, uh, over 500 farm workers marched to the house of that crew leader, screaming and shouting, if you hit one of us, it's like hitting all of us. We need an end to this physical assault and physical abuse. Así es. Entonces, como vimos también para estos rancheros para ceder ese pago, tuvimos que hacer una marcha de 234 millas de ir a la Asociación de Frutas y Vegetales en, en Orlando, en Tampa, me parece, en las oficinas de los vegetables, de los uh, frutas, ¿no? Para decir de que ellos que vengan y que paguen un poco más a los trabajadores. Bueno, se, se obtuvo esa cantidad, pero queríamos ver en dónde nosotros podíamos presionar un poco más y los rancheros, pero no, en realidad no era solo los rancheros. Teníamos que buscar otra forma de salir nosotros de Imocali para ir a, a boicotear a, a, a Taco Bell, que era, son las corporaciones grandes, que ellos son los que tienen el mayor poder de exigir lo que era la cantidad, la calidad de tomate, lo que es la, el color. Pero a nosotros como trabajadores nos exigía, du, durábamos 12 horas, hasta 12 horas trabajando en los ranchos para poder completar las demandas que hacían estos grandes corporaciones. Yeah, and so after taking these actions, these marches, these work stoppages, we did a, a march to the Florida Tomato Growers Exchange, which represents the vast majority of the farms in Immokalee, where farm workers work at. And we started seeing some, uh, some change um, in some places, but not any movement in others. And we started realizing that in reality, in the agriculture industry and in the food systems industry in general, farms don't actually have that massive amount of power um, and don't have, uh, yeah, don't have the power to actually create the necessary change that farm workers needed at that time. And that we didn't necessarily have, uh, we didn't have leverage to get these farms to actually do something. And so in around, around the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, we started realizing perhaps if we get big time food corporations to demand better working conditions for farm workers, maybe by them using their power and their position as massive buyers in the industry, we can direct change down to their supply chains or through their supply chains. And the main reasoning for that was this, the farms where the farm workers in Immokalee are working at, they, we as farm workers need to adhere to the demands of, of these corporations, corporations like Taco Bell. When Taco Bell comes to a farm and is gonna do business with the farm, they say, we want a specific color, a specific size, we want this, this amount of tons at this price by this date. So they demand all of these things. And the farm workers in the fields are adhering to those demands, making sure to pick tomatoes of a certain size, of a certain color, sometimes working 8, 10, 12 hours in the fields to make sure that the orders by these corporations are met so that they, they continue to do business with the farms. And so for that reason, we, we shifted and said, Maybe if we pressure the food corporations to demand better working conditions for farm workers, that will sort of trickle down better working conditions down their supply chain by leveraging their power as corporations. Así es, y como coalición, como trabajadores, no solamente uh, pudimos hacer eso, sino pedimos salir 
gritar nuestras voces en diferentes estados, con gente de fe, con uh, eh, más que nada con las universidades, ya que pues las corporaciones grandes siempre tienen su comida rápida en las universidades. Entonces, donde nos enfocamos también de ellos, um, en nuestra comunidad también, en las comunidades que nos apoyaban para poder dar este, este voz y decir que las corporaciones grandes son los que tienen el mayor poder, pero como trabajador siempre tenemos el bajo precio que ni nos alcanzaba para la comida de nuestra mesa, de nuestra familia, ¿no? Entonces, es lo que nosotros presionamos y la razón que, bueno, la que pedíamos a estas corporaciones grandes es cero tolerancia de, en el campo, eh, que haya una voz del trabajador y pagar un centavo o más por libra de tomate para trabajadores, para que tengan un poquito más extra de dinero a los trabajadores. Y eso es lo que nosotros estamos pidiendo a estas grandes corporaciones. Yeah, but when we started this campaign targeting these food corporations, we understood that we were just tomato workers from a small rural town in Southwest Florida that no one really knew about. And so what we started doing was then going outside of our Immokalee community, going to university classrooms, going to churches, going to local organizations, meeting with other unions and other organizations, educating them about the conditions that farm workers were facing and asking that they use their voice, that they use their purchasing power, that they use their money to pressure these corporations to use their massive power uh, to, to bring about better working conditions in their supply chain. And the main focus specifically around the Taco Bell campaign was in universities across the country. Um, I'm adding a little bit here, but universities had Taco Bells in their food in their food courts and universities all across the country. And students, after learning about the issues of forced labor and sexual harassment and sexual violence, wanted to stand in solidarity with the CIW farm workers and began to organize in their colleges to kick Taco Bell off of campus unless they signed an agreement with the CIW farm workers or did something about the CIW's farm workers conditions. It, all in all, 25 universities kicked Taco Bell off campus. Now, what were we asking though, before getting into that, what were we asking of Taco Bell and uh, in terms of our demands? So the first demand was that they simply pay one penny more per pound of tomatoes that they purchase that that penny more go directly to the farm workers' pockets as an added bonus for the work that they were doing. The second demand was for, for there to be, for farm workers to have a voice in the workplace where they can speak out uh, of, of any abuse that they may face and not be fearful of losing their job or of being retaliated against. And to know that there was actually gonna be a consequence if they did speak out against a human rights abuse. And the third demand, was for Taco Bell to abide by a zero tolerance policy where they would not purchase from farms where there was sexual violence or modern day slavery happening. And so Taco Bell would not be able to buy from those types of farms. Así es, entonces pues ahora gracias a estas corporaciones que ya se han unido, que ya son 14 ahora que están, bueno, tenemos otras también de otras organizaciones que han estado del programa por comida justa, llevando por más de, de años que cuando ya firmaron estos 14 corporaciones, por eso llegó lo que es el programa por comida justa, que ahora está. Y el programa de comida justa, pues se hace educación con los trabajadores, de trabajador a trabajador, y se creó un libro de nosotros aquí como trabajadores para llevar esta educación de decir dónde ellos pueden reportar los abusos que uno enfrenta en, en los campos. Entonces, ellos esa oportunidad que tienen de si, si están robándole el salario, si tienen un eh, acoso sexual más que nada por las mujeres, porque en ese tiempo pues no había tantas mujeres, era mayormente era puros hombres, por eso era mucho acoso sexual que pasaba en ese tiempo en los campos. Entonces, ahora es el programa que está ahora mismo, tienen acceso a sombra porque eso no teníamos antes, baños limpios, este, agua limpia también porque ese tiempo pues tampoco no nos, 
no nos, uh, no nos daban acceso al agua limpia tampoco. Nos decían, teníamos que llevar nuestro propio agua para tomar porque no nos, no nos daban el agua en esos años. Yeah, and so after five years of a campaign with Taco Bell, Taco Bell signed a legally binding agreement with CIW agreeing to those demands. Uh, since that initial agreement with Taco Bell and the years following, 14 of the biggest food corporations, we have had campaigns with McDonald's, with Burger King, with, with Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. 14 of the biggest food corporations in the world have followed suit and have also signed legally binding agreements with CIW to bring about farm worker protections within their supply chain. Um, around 2010, after getting this massive sort of amount of backup from corporations that were saying, we're ready to do our part in, in, in bringing these conditions to or changing the conditions in our supply chains, those farms that used to ignore CIW's demands now wanted to come to the table. And in 2010-2011, we started what we call today the Fair Food Program, which is the embodiment of those demands, but actually being carried out in the fields, those protections, those rights um, being actually carried out in the tomato industry of Florida. And so part of, the, uh, part of the Fair Food Program, one of the most important elements of the Fair Food Program is what Silvia was saying was what you see in this, ima this image here, which is an education, worker to worker education session. So what you're seeing here is former farm workers or even current farm workers speaking to fellow farm workers about what rights they're entitled to under the Fair Food Program, but also what mechanisms are in place for them to speak out against any abuse that they may face, right? And so these, and in these education sessions, farm workers like Silvia give a little booklet to the workers that details all of their rights. I'm adding this, those booklets can be in English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and even some indigenous languages as well. And again, these, these booklets are broken down, simplified, so that they understand what they're entitled to, how to best protect themselves. In this image, we see the Fair Food Program actually at work. One of the things is the right for farm workers to have shaded structures in the workplace. These shaded structures that you see in the image are not a given for farm workers. Um, and for the most part, aren't necessarily even part of practice for there to be these shaded structures with seating area for, for farm workers to sit down and be able to have a meal. That's not common occurrence. Another thing that you see in this image is back here, which is a bathroom, a bathroom for farm workers to use. Again, not necessarily commonplace in the agriculture industry, but a demand and a right that farm workers are entitled to under the Fair Food Program. Additionally, there's access to clean water. Even access to water wasn't a given for most farm workers, but this Fair Food Program is ensuring that all of these basic rights, as well as these abuses that farm workers were facing, are being phased out of the agricultural industry. Así es, y en el programa de Comida Justa existe este tercer partido que es el Consejo por Comida Justa, que ellos se encargan en monitorear, uh, hacer entrevista a trabajadores en persona por persona, al ranchero, al contratista, más que nada hace entrevista con los trabajadores para ver dónde uh, el ranchero está fallando o la, el contratista, ¿no? Para poder mejorar las condiciones dentro de los ranchos. Pero como saben, si ellos cometen alguno de los contratistas del acoso sexual, los van a despedir. Los despiden dentro de, de este ranchero porque esas es, las corporaciones grandes firmaron para eso, que no haya acoso sexual dentro del campo. Nada de, nada de eso. Entonces, el consejo se encarga de, de hacer todo eso y también ellos se encargan de que se le llegue el centavo a los trabajadores que llega directamente al rancho, del rancho al, a los trabajadores. Ellos se encargan de monitorear eso. Tienen la línea de 24 horas, los siete días de la semana. Yeah, and so, however, another thing that's important is, well, how does these actual rights and protections, how is this program actually being carried out? And so here is where another organization comes in. So right here we have someone who works with the Fair Food Standards Council, a third party monitoring system that is the monitoring, that monitors the Fair Food Program and ensures that all of those contracts, all of those agreements, that all of the 
uh, all of the points that were made in those agreements that were said to be carried out, that they actually are being carried out. Now, how do they make sure that this is happening? Well, part of what they do is that they have free range to access to any of the participating farms, and they interview the farm workers like she's doing here directly, speaking with them anonymously if they wish to do so, interviewing over 50% of the workforce to find out what is actually happening in the fields. Is there something that the crew leaders, that the supervisors, that the managers aren't doing that needs to be changed? Uh, being a person that, that a farm worker can confide in without, again, without fear, without, um, without there being a fear that there's going to be retaliation or that I'm going to lose my job. Um, on top of that, the, this uh, third party monitoring system um, also oversees the distribution of the bonus, which is that penny more per pound. They have access to the books of those farms and can make sure, again, that it can track that that bonus is actually getting to the farm workers who were working at that farm. Now, let's say a farm worker is feeling a bit intimidated or doesn't want to talk to uh, that person right then and there. They can, uh, they, uh, the, the Fair Food Standards Council runs a 24 7 hotline that farm workers can call anonymously again if they wish to do so in any language that they wish to do so, to file any complaint, to talk about any abuse um, that is happening. And they are going to know that there's going to be a consequence. Now, if there is an issue of sexual violence or modern day slavery, which are the zero tolerance issues we mentioned, and it's investigated and it's found out that that is indeed the case, that this indeed happened, that is a zero tolerance issue. So that means that crew leader, that supervisor must be fired, must be kicked out of the farm. Now, let's say this farm doesn't want to do that. Well, that's where the fair food agreements come and the corporations must cease all business with that farm until that farm abides by the zero tolerance policy. And so what that means, and I'm adding this here, is that a corporate uh, that for a farm, it becomes a business decision, not just a moral decision. It becomes a business decision. Do you want to keep your business with these corporations? Well, then you need to do right and make sure that the farm workers in your farm are actually being treated with respect, that there are no abuses happening in the fields. Así es, y bueno, pues como vemos, es el, uh, tenemos esta estadística, ¿verdad? Que como trabajadores han educado muchos trabajadores cada año. Uh, el bono también que se ha recibido los trabajadores. Igual uh, es uh, este programa o este, um, eh, más bien este programa de comida justa funciona. Funciona el 100%, como vemos. Son las estadísticas que, que ha funcionado dentro del, del programa de comida justa. Yeah. And so this next slide here shows some of the statistics. Uh, since the inception of the Fair Food Program in 2011, there have been well over 1,100 worker to worker education sessions, over uh, 29,000 worker interviews, uh, workers, um, I'm sorry. Uh, there have been over 3,000 complaints that have come through and have been handled successfully. And that penny more per pound has equaled close to $37 million that have gone directly to the farm workers since 2011. And so these are all these statistics on how this program is working and is making a change for the farm workers uh, that work in the fields where this program is getting implemented. Así es, y como vemos la mapa aquí, pues está uh, todo donde tiene la estrella, pues está extendido el programa por comida justa. De igual manera, nosotros como coalición vamos, hacemos uh, educación para recordar que los trabajadores siguen sus derechos, que ellos no tengan miedo de reportar cualquier abuso que ellos enfrentan. De igual manera, tenemos lo que es una mapa color azul, eh, Bueno, pero también eso tenemos lo que ya es la fresa, chile dulce. Uh, hay otra de California que estamos trabajando. Ojalá que lleguemos, que llegue el programa de expansión, que es la expansión del eh, que está progresando. Como vemos en Vermont, es una expansión que está dentro del programa también de comida justa, que ellos vinieron a aprender como modelo de del programa de comida justa para aplicar también en otras industrias. Entonces, igual manera, uh, tenemos lo que es las flores también, las flores de Blumia, que también ha estado uh, 
este, aprendiendo del modelo del programa para aplicar en otras industrias. Entonces es lo que nos, nos alegra de que hay muchas uh, industrias que quieren aplicar el programa para cambiar la vida de los trabajadores que enfrentan de diferentes um, acosos o lo que sea, robo de salario en los, en los campos o donde quiera que trabajen. Yeah, this next image that you see here, though, also, besides the actual change in reality that farm workers are facing or are, are having um, in 90% of Florida's tomato industry, this fair food program has expanded to other states as well um, and to other industries. We've expanded following the East Coast, which is the migratory pattern of most farm workers, um, to more tomato fields in those states, but also to green pepper, to strawberry even into the cut flower industry in the state of Virginia. This model is expanding to encompass more and more workers that have faced similar labor abuses and human rights abuses in their workplace. The model of the Fair Food Program is so successful that other states, like you see here in California, there's an expansion in progress to expand uh, these protections uh, there to workers in that state. But also the model has been adopted to industries that are completely uh, or are similar to agriculture, but aren't the regular tomato fields of, uh, uh, of, of Florida or, or, or fields of agriculture. And what I mean by that is, for example, in this map, you see the blue state of Vermont. Vermont, uh, there's an organization there called uh, Migrant Justice. They are dairy workers who also have faced similar issues. They came down to Immokalee, to Florida, to learn about how this program is actually uh, changing the lives of farm workers and have been able to take elements of this program and start their own version of this program, but for dairy workers in that state and have actually signed an agreement with Ben and Jerry's starting what we call the Milk with Dignity program. And so even the model of this fair food program is being adopted by other workers in other industries facing similar human rights abuses as what uh, the Immokalee farm workers used to face here in our community. Y sabemos que ya está el programa, ¿verdad? Que se ha extendido de varios estados, pero sabemos que hay todavía miles de trabajadores que enfrentan los abusos. Por ejemplo, Wendy's, que esto, uh, Wendy's estaba aquí en el sur de la Florida comprando su tomate, pero cuando entró el programa de comida justa, él huyó de aquí, de, del sur de la Florida, que fue a México a comprar uh, su tomate a... Uh, en, eh, ¿cómo se llama? De Bioparque de Occidente, que donde se descubrió que compraba el mayor uh, tomate, lo que usaba en su restaurante, que trabajaban mujeres, niños, pequeños, eh, malas condiciones. Entonces es una de las cosas que Wendy's, él, uh, el mayor, uh, el presidente en el pez, lo que le interesa son sus beneficios, pero él no da el beneficio, el derecho o la dignidad de los trabajadores que ellos trabajan a uh, 12 horas para dar, uh, para llegar la comida en la mesa de, de todo el mundo, ¿verdad? De donde llega el, el tomate, porque como consumidor nosotros consumimos la, la, la comida, nuestra hamburguesa, comemos riquísimo, ¿verdad? Pero no sabemos de dónde viene este tomate, si viene con derecho a los trabajadores o abusado de los trabajadores. Entonces, Wendy es lo que se, se ha negado en participar en el programa. Seguimos boicoteando a Wendy. Um, en un momento vamos a decir también que tenemos una, eh, vamos a seguir con la acción que tenemos este año. Y pues ahora esta acción lo vamos a tener aquí en el sur de la Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so... Although the Fair Food Program and this work with CIW has been able to change um, the lives of many farm workers, it's only a small percentage of all of the farm workers that continue to toil in human rights with human rights abuses and facing human rights abuses throughout the U.S. agricultural industry and the world agricultural industry. And so for that reason, we must continue our campaigns to get more corporations to sign on, to join this pro program and to help expand it into their supply chains. And unfortunately, one of the corporations that has not been on the side of joining this program has been Wendy's. Um, Wendy's actually used to purchase from farms in the state of Florida. 
But when we asked them to join the Fair Food Program to sign a legally binding agreement, they shifted their purchasing to Mexico. In Mexico, uh, an LA Times expose showed that they were buying from farms, a farm called Bio Parques de Occidente. In that farm, there was children as young as seven years old working in those fields, carrying those 32 pound buckets, rampant sexual violence towards farm worker women and rampant forced labor so much so that the Mexican government had to get involved to free some of those workers. And so Wendy's went from an industry that is trying to change that reality of, of farm worker abuse to one that is still stuck in this old status quo of agriculture, which is not caring about the dignity um, and the humanity of farm workers. And so for that reason, we've called a boycott of Wendy's for people to stop purchasing at Wendy's because they are, again, uh, continuing this disconnection between consumers, corporations, and their responsibility towards workers in their supply chain, where people are just not aware of, about where does the tomato slice in their burger, in their salad come from, which for the most part, it's picked by a farm worker who sometimes worked eight, 10, 12 hours and might have faced all types of abuse to put that tomato in that salad or in that hamburger. And so for that reason, we've been pressuring Wendy's to do the right thing, to do what all of its major competitors have already done and expand, the, and expand this program into their supply chain to ensure human rights protections for their farm workers. And, and there's many ways uh, to take action uh, or to participate in this. Um, but uh, before we go, tal vez, uh, um, Lo abrimos para preguntas, Silvia. Yeah, so we, we can open it up to any questions that you all may have. Um, also, we do have some, um, some slides here to talk about the impact of COVID on farm workers. We could talk a little bit about that before getting into questions, but uh, if that seems like a worthwhile thing to talk about, um, let me know. We're more than happy to talk about it. Yeah, let's see the slides. Okay, awesome. Just go into the COVID thing because this would also be interesting and help out a little bit more. Sure, sure, absolutely. Entonces, si podemos hablar un poquito de cómo COVID ha afectado a los trabajadores y el trabajo de la coalición en eso de COVID. Claro que sí, pues uh, sabemos que teníamos una acción grande para Nueva York en ese tiempo, ¿verdad? Pero con todo que vino COVID, pues se canceló todo. Fue una tristeza para nosotros porque íbamos a ir a Nueva York con, ya teníamos dos voces de trabajadores para ir nuestra acción allá. Pero desafortunadamente con COVID pues uh, se canceló todo. Entonces lo que hicimos nosotros aquí pues no dejamos solo la comunidad. Trabajamos bastante aquí. Um, la coalición trabajó a ayudar a la comunidad. Más que nada hicimos una, un llamado para el presidente, ¿verdad? Para el, el, gobernador. el gobernador de aquí de la Florida. Pero él no hacía nada. Entonces uh, las noticias pasaban en las redes sociales y lo que vinieron fueron a uh, los médicos sin fronteras que realmente ellos no eran su trabajo, lo que ellos hacen, pero nosotros pidimos ayuda porque aquí mayormente el 90% queda el tomate aquí. Entonces muchísimos trabajadores sabiendo que se contagia uno, se puede contagiar muchos porque en un bus se va 60 trabajadores y vive en las trailas que viven hasta 12 a 15 personas en una traila. Entonces nosotros trabajamos para pedir ayuda, pedir mascarilla, desinfectante, no sé cuántos mascarillas, mucho eh, sé como 50 mil mascarillas que hemos repartido aquí en nuestra comunidad, desinfectante y pues ellos, los médicos sin fronteras son los que vinieron a dar ese apoyo aquí en, en, en Imocali con la comunidad que tuvieron dando este, este apoyo para ellos. Yeah, so to mention a little bit or put into context what Silvia was saying, you know, in early 2020, we were actually planning a big protest in New York for our Wendy's campaign because the majority owner of, of, of Wendy's and their board chairman is based in New York City. And so we were bringing two buses of farm workers to Wall Street, right, to, to, to pressure the owners of this corporation to bring but then COVID hit and, and it impacted everybody and, and we're still living it. But, um, and farm workers were no exception to this. And so we shifted our attention from the campaign with Wendy's 
to how can we support the farm worker community here in, in our community of Immokalee, but the wider state of Florida as well. And so what we started doing in March, we launched an op-ed on the New York Times sounding the alarm that farm workers needed to be prioritized or there needed to be a plan made by our, our local officials to make sure that these medical resources, the testing, that hand sanitizer, that face mask were getting to the farm worker community because they are high risk for many, many reasons. One, first and foremost, is they're essential workers. You can't pick a tomato from Zoom. You have to go to the to have, you got to go to the farm to pick it, right? And so the agriculture industry continued, right? All of us need to keep eating, right? And so what that means is that farm workers are continuing to toil, continuing to go to the fields. And what that means is they're going in a bus, like the school bus that you see on the upper left corner here, with 40, 50, 60 other farm workers, right? And if, and if one of them is sick. They could get many of them sick, right? Now you may say, okay, well, you get you know get sick, you can isolate, but most farm workers live in trailer homes with eight, 10, 12 other farm workers in that trailer home. So you can't really self-isolate. And so for that reason, we were calling on our governor here, Governor DeSantis, to do something to protect farm workers uh, from this pandemic. Honestly, we weren't necessarily too optimistic that we were going to get anything. And so we looked for alternative ways to support the Immokalee community. So first and foremost, we are, are the, those who have supported our struggle throughout the years started sending face masks, started sending hand sanitizer, started donating, and we started giving out. We've given out tens of thousands, probably well over 50,000 face masks in the Immokalee community well over 50,000 hand sanitizers to, to the farm workers here. We've been putting out posters like the one you see to your right all around the community as well. But then we also partnered up with other nonprofit organizations, one that you all may know, which is Doctors Without Borders, right? Doctors Without Borders, interna internationally recognized, doesn't often do too much work in, in, in the United States, but they felt and we're compelled to come here to Immokalee and started doing pop-up testing um, in, in the Immokalee community and, uh, in order to, again, make sure that people had access to testing and weren't getting others sick. Así es. Y bueno, como saben, uh, pues nosotros aquí en nuestra comunidad de Immokalee no tenemos un hospital cerca. Tenemos que ir hasta 45, 50 minutos eh, para llegar en un hospital. Entonces, de esa manera nosotros pedimos apoyo para que apoyaran a estos trabajadores. Nosotros trabajamos muchísimos aquí en nuestra comunidad de tocar puertas a puertas a dar, uh, como le dije, uh, mascarilla, sanitizante, uh, dar educación a los trabajadores también porque muchos de los trabajadores no escuchan la radio, no tienen televisión. Entonces nosotros aquí salimos para dar educación a nuestra comunidad. Yeah, and so what we started doing again is, is you know, shifting towards giving, getting these resources and advocating for resources. The closest hospital to Immokalee is about 45 minutes to an hour away from here. And so we wanted to make sure that people were able to get testing or, or access to some medical resources right here in their community. We started going doorstep to doorstep, obviously socially distanced with mask on, with gloves on, giving uh, giving information on how to best protect yourself, giving face masks out, giving hand sanitizer out. And also we advocated to make sure that the Immokalee community was one of the first ones to get vaccines, as you can see in the image here, where uh, hundreds and thousands of workers honestly came out came out to get vaccines. And so uh, that that's part of the work that we've been able to do. It's part of the work that we've been able to do, Silvia. Yeah. And so with that being said, there, there's not too much more there. If you have any questions, we can turn it over to, to Charles or, or, or Tim in terms of any questions uh, that folks might have. OK. Um, um, all right. Well, we I have our, I have OK. Questions. Go ahead, Alana. Uh, let's get our questions. Excuse my voice, please. Okay, thank you so much for your speech. Listen, I have actually a couple of questions, but right now I will ask one question. Um, 
Do you ask any or somebody ask like in medical field people who do vaccination for the people uh, if they vaccinated and if they have, you know, uh, writing, writing verification, because it's also very important. Because, you know, some people, you know, how people different, but we absolutely know, especially in farmers, thank you so much. It's very big appreciation for you because you try to keep uh, energetic, you know, rules. But you also request for you guys, if you affiliate with farmer, please, because for our all our good health, people who do vaccination, maybe, you know, maybe they come from town or whatever, also need to present vaccination through writing verification to people. To some, some people don't care, but some people care. For example, I am care, I care. I care about so many stuff. <laughs> um, and also, thank you so much for applause for give people sanitation, uh, disinfection for hands, because it's most important. Not, not only, you know, disposable gloves, but you know, like tips, of the fingers, you know, uh, disinfect and disposable glass and this is pay, also pay attention. So please uh, don't ignore. And one more uh, from what I hear uh, and I speak different language, but listen, I so much respect and me gusta espanol, trust me, <laughs> very much respect you guys. So um, also I would like Asking. How about a question? Yeah, asking. asking. Not a question if, okay. My question is, if really union, you know, union, farmer union, if they care about people, you know, like those manager or uh, uh, leader of the union, it's it's ridiculous how they how they treat some workers. I saw some of them. I'm ready to cry because I feel sorry. For them. Whatever I can give donation, I try to you know give donation even if I'm going to a vegetable and fruit store because I know how it's respectful. But you know, my question: if you can put more attention to union people, so to speak, to take more care about those farmers about the medical needs you know okay and and thank you so much again and thank you guys for the opportunity for me to ask questions thank you very much okay go ahead and answer it yes so yeah, yeah, just yeah. To make sure, so the question then was around unions um and 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 giving more effort towards unions on farm workers so um to, so I'll, I'll answer this one and sylvia will definitely be answering others but <laughs> Farm workers, just as an FYI, farm workers have been left out of the National Labor Relations uh, mm -hmm. by the NLRB uh, of the opportunity to unionize in, uh, federally. Um, and this Why? was part of New Deal legislation back in the 30s um, when New, New Deal legislation by uh, Roosevelt, and he needed to get at that time what was called Dixie Democrats. You can understand why they were called Dixie Democrats. And they uh -huh. said, we'll get you their vote you'll get our vote insofar as you leave two industries outside right and that is uh farm workers and domestic workers um right. many many theories are out as to why they chose but one of the most well accepted ones is that this was just a way of imposing uh jim crow type legislation federally mm -hmm. because most of the farm workers and domestic workers mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s were black um and so um, so for the most part, some states, uh, including the California, and finally, I believe in two years ago, New York, mm -hmm. uh, finally allowed farm workers to unionize. But outside of those two states, no farm workers have the opportunity to unionize. Uh, maybe North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, I know Flock is there. But outside of those uh, two or three states, there, n there aren't unions or there aren't mm -hmm. uh, uh, farm workers aren't allowed to unionize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, let Janice go, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Okay, Janice, let's uh, you go ahead. And, uh, you got the next question, Janice, and then Tracy will go to you. Thank you. Um, since you since you um, spoke about the housing ar arrangements in trailers of trucks. I want to know how workers who live in such circumstance 
such terrible circumstances, how they get water and how do they, get, you know, prepare food. And, you know, since they don't have any resources, uh, utilities. Como la, la vivienda de las trailers, yes. Sí, sí uh, qué bueno y gracias por la pregunta. Uh, pues sí, uh, trabajadores tienen que levantar porque usualmente yo igual viví en las trailers con 15 personas en el mismo. Y lo que hacíamos es que nos levantamos a las 3, 3 de la mañana, 4 de la mañana para poder cocinar. O sea, sí nos proveen agua, cocina para poder cocinar. Entonces, Esa es la razón que nosotros tenemos que levantar temprano para poder cocinar todos y llevar nuestra pro propia comida en, en, en el campo para, para trabajar. Yeah, so, so Silvia says, you know, thank you for the question. Um, so she's answering actually from her own personal experiences being a farm worker who worked, who lived in a trailer home uh, and who, who lived in a trailer home with 13 other farm workers. And the practice is, well, first, the trailer homes do have access to water, do have access to gas stoves, um, and have access to electricity. Now, they're not really in the, you know, these aren't the most upkept trailers, but they do at least have those basic necessities. And for the most part, um, what, what you do is you just have to plan really ahead. So what, what farm workers do is, you know, if they're going to go to work at 5, 6 in the morning, you've got farm workers work, waking up at 3 a.m., so that one of them can cook breakfast and the next one can cook breakfast and you know someone takes turn getting taking a shower and all that kind of stuff or showering at night you know in order to take turns so it's 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 very you know it's all about planning in advance because all of these amenities the very little amenities amenities that you have you're sharing them amongst a, a big group and so that's kind of what what it what it's like you know waking up earlier to prepare your food when you're taking it home um, waking up earlier to take a shower and, and all that stuff. Era muy difícil porque ya cuando uno tiene oh, los niños, you. ¿verdad? Es algo, algo difícil, pero uno no hay manera de cómo vivir solos porque, como sabe, es un poco pago en lo que ganamos en lo que es la agricultura. Entonces, desafortunadamente, tenemos que vivir con varias personas para, po para poder pagar la renta. Yeah. And it's extremely difficult, um, you know, to live this kind of way, especially when you have a family and you have, you know, children um, who you who share in that housing with others. And, and, and as a family, you know, you're not getting paid that much for doing agricultural work. And so you can't afford another kind of space that that, you know, has better amenities, that has more space for you and your family because you're not getting paid um, all that much. And so it's extremely difficult, you know, to live this way, especially when you when you have a family. Where they take shower? Can I ask question and answer? Hey, please. Can, they, can, hey. I, can I ask um, the question? You don't have the word. Uh, oh, yeah, it's, no, it's the right floor. now. Right now, our caller uh, at eight, and then I'm sorry, Tracy's <laughs> next, and our caller uh, at uh, two nine three five. Wait, you to introduce yourself, please, real quick. Tracy, oh, go ahead. Jake. Hi, hi, All right, Jake. Jake is my name. Hi, All right, Jake. Uh, I, no, no, Jake, 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 yeah. after Tracy. Right. Okay. okay, I'll take you okay. next. Tracy's right. next and then Jake. Hi, Sorry CIW. Jake. Go ahead, Tracy. Hi, CIW. Um, wonderful presentation. I have a lot of respect for you. Um, I have a lot of admiration. Um, I think that people like you are the most important people. You provide for our survival, uh, our enjoyment of food. Um, so um, it's unfortunate the conditions I know you have to work through. Let me ask you this if I may, however, I'm a longtime supporter of CIW. I've been on their listserv for years. Uh, and by supporter, I mean financial, modest, but consistent over the last several years. Um, I don't know if I mentioned I'm on the listserv. I think you guys send out about one, 
one mass email a month, which is pretty bulky. You know, to give you an idea how familiar I am with CIW, I'm aware of farm worker Morales being slain by the police department outside Mokali. And this is my question is recent, uh, recently on the list, the text, the information in the email paid tribute to Amazon. Right there, that disconnected me automatically with CIW. In fact, I um, requested I be removed from the list and I um, canceled my $5 monthly contribution to CIW. Why are you promoting Amazon? Hey, Tracy, um, I can respond to that question. Um, from We don't take any sort of financial donation from Amazon in any way. Um, and it, you, know, you don't have to take my word for it. We're a nonprofit, so all of our financial records are public. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not too sure where you got the information that we are promoting Amazon. Um, I'm not aware of it. Uh, we do have a comms team that handles that kind of stuff. But uh, from as a staff member, we're not aware of any of any promotion of Amazon. We don't have any deal with promoting Amazon in any way. But if you want to send us where you've seen that, I'd be more than happy to look into it and get a response back to you. But we don't have a partnership with Amazon. We don't take money from any corporations. Let me follow up if I may. Sure. Um, he answered it, I think, Tracy. No, he yeah, didn't. I have a question. All right, right now it's going to be Jake, and then we'll go to you, Laura. Just go I ahead. I think that's wrong. If I have a direct response to that answer, I should be able to um, uh, verbalize it. Good yeah. luck. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead, finish up, Tracy. Tracy, go ahead and finish up. Did he go? All right. Uh, did, did Tracy go? Go to the next one, Tim. The next oh. question. No, no, no. After uh, Tracy <laughs> left. All right, Jake, go ahead. Okay, I got two questions for you. Number one, is there is there any move on the national level to amend the National Labor Relations Act to include uh, agricultural workers? And number two, what was my other question? Um, I'll come back to it because I forget now. Just, just go ahead with that. First. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so unfortunately, and this is kind of where the scope of us as an organization is very limited. The CIW exists as a 501c3 organization, as a charitable organization, and therefore electoral work um, is not really part of uh, of the strategy or tactics that we use. No, this I mean, is not electoral. This is not electoral work. This is this or, is this or is, any any sort of policy work. Um, and, and, okay, and any okay. yeah yeah any sort of policy, any sort of legislative work. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be specifically okay. a candidate or anything, but sure, any policy okay. work, whatever word you want to use it. Yeah. So, okay. because of a five hundred one c three scope, we're not really able to step into the legislative element of it. Um, there are organizations like uh, like. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the United Farm Workers who do have an arm of their organization that have, that are pushing for uh, legislation that is uh, friendlier to farm workers. I am not aware that they are pushing legislation to amend the National Labor Relations, um, uh, that, that law that affects unions for farm workers. Um, I do know that they were focused on citizenship for farm workers. Um, uh, by the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, um, but I am not too aware. We're not ourselves as an organization working on that legislation, and I'm not familiar with any other farm worker organizations doing work to, to change that, unfortunately. What does CIF stand for? The, it's CIW, it's the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Oh, okay, okay. My other question, I remember the other question, 
Is there any move? Is there any move on the part of farm workers, either in Florida or other parts of the country, to pool their resources or to borrow money in order to um, buy a farm and turn it into a worker-owned cooperative? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Well, there were some talks, at least from our organization, about doing some co-op work. Um, right. And but there, those haven't materialized at the moment. But I do yeah. know that there are plans um, to do co-ops specific. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily out of the question, at, at least in, in the near future. But at least at the moment, we don't have that. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a question quick? You know, L Lana, after Laura is okay. Laura Paydox next, and then we'll put you down. You already had one, but the goat will. Uh, Put you down next okay laura go ahead um i came on a little late and i understand that you've reached out to different corporations and many of them have been on board um and wendy's was one that wasn't um have you had mostly success with the corporations that you have approached Or have you had multiple situations like Wendy's where um, they just haven't been interested in providing that kind of um, security to employees? Sí, uh, gracias por su pregunta. Y creo que uh, mucho de como ya tenemos 14 en este momento lo que está dentro del programa por comida justa. Pero sabemos que está Publix, que hemos batallado mucho con él que hemos mm, estado boicoteando también, haciendo huelgas de hambre, igual como Wendy's, que ya tenemos ocho años que no, que no ha querido venir a participar dentro del programa para, más que nada, para proteger a los trabajadores. Ellos ven a su beneficio de ellos, pero no a, a proteger a los derechos de los trabajadores. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Laura, for your question. Um, it's a great question. So, um, since the start of the campaign for fair food, which started launched in 2000, it's been mostly successful. Um, only uh, we have gotten the 14 big food corporations, Walmart, uh, Whole Foods, uh, the top of the top five fast food corporations, four of them, some of the big uh, sort of food service like Aramark, Sodexo, we've gotten to successfully join through campaigns. So most of them have been successful and, uh, you know, and it's been some have come um, easier than others, right? Some have been more campaigns and public pressure and stuff, but others have, and, and that's sort of been variable. But the two corporations that have sort of been responded like Wendy's has, has been Publix, which is a, a, a grocery store down in the South based out of Lakeland, Florida, um, and, and, and Wendy's who have been sort of reluctant. Uh, Publix was actually one of the main subjects in a documentary done about CIW called Food Chains, which I recommend that you all watch it if you have some free time, it should be free on YouTube. Publix has for 10 years, over 10 years, refused to participate in this program, even though the CIW and the farm workers are in its own state in the state of Florida. And Wendy's is, is the other one that for seven, now kind of close to eight years has also been refused, but for the most part, there has been success. Mm -hmm. Now, can I ask yep. question? Tim, go right ahead. Um, go ahead, Laura. Tim, you shouldn't, yes. be, you shouldn't be cruising the net while you're the chair, please. I'm not cruising the All net. All right, that, my question is what precisely, uh, Sylvia or Uriel, are the wages? Are there any benefits? to afforded the employees? Um, are there any uh, deductions, uh, bonuses, or uh, um, specifically charges imposed upon the employees by the employer? I mean, how much, um, what is, what are the wages, the working conditions in general? in terms of remuneration. Gracias por su pregunta. Uh, pues sí, uh, trabajadores uh, ahorita en este año ya está ganando uh, 70 centavos a 75 centavos la pieza de tomate que ha subido con toda la lucha que se ha puesto. Y igual manera, um, 
lo que es uh, el seguro médico, pues no lo tiene, uh, pero uh, el, el, el ranchero, si pasa un accidente, uh, los trabajadores le paga el, eh, le paga ese médico o lo paga el hospital o le da eh, medicina, ¿verdad? Pero no tiene un seguro médico para estos trabajadores. Es eh, lo que, uh, dependiendo el trabajador, porque las compañías dan esa, uh, esa aplicación para hacer uh, uh, el de médico, pero realmente es dependiendo del trabajador si lo quiere uh, hacerlo o aplicar esta aplicación. Pero realmente uh, el, el ranchero sí protege al trabajador si pasa algún accidente. Yeah, so to answer your question, Charles, um, so first, the per bucket rate of tomatoes, which is the 32 pound bucket, has gone up. Uh, the average is around 70 to 75, per, 75 cents for that bucket. It's not massive increase. Um, but it, it has gone up. Um, the bonus, and I'm adding this, is also part of it, which is an extra, an extra 32 cents on top of that per bucket rate, which brings it to, you know, to close to a dollar of your earnings, you know, 75 cents and such. Um, and what that means is an extra 50, $100 in someone's paycheck through the Fair Food Program bonus. But outside of the, of that, uh, of the Fair Food Program, you're not getting that bonus. Um, however, Um, the way that farm workers get paid is by piece rate, but the state of Florida has a minimum wage of $10 um, and, and here in, in, in 2022. And so what that means is, and I'm explaining this a little bit more, is the $10 become a floor for the farm worker, right? If they don't pick as many buckets to equal $10, then the farm must make them whole and get them to $10. However, if they pick enough buckets to go above $10, then they're free to do so, right, through their per bucket rate. It's sort of as if you were a tipped worker, right? If your tips get you well over the minimum wage, well, then that's great, you know. So, but the, the minimum wage, the Florida minimum wage becomes a floor for farm workers, and then it, it goes above that. However, again, outside of the Fair Food Program, and for the most part in, ag in the agriculture industries, farm workers do not often get paid they get paid below minimum wage, even though there's laws against them getting paid that, but most farm workers um, are getting paid below that. Now, in terms of benefits, um, farm workers do not get any sort of medical insurance or retirement plan as being farm workers. We're really far away from that in, in reality. Um, what we have managed to do through the Fair Food Program is that the, the farm where a farm worker is working, that if there is an accident, if there is a medical emergency, they must take on the cost for on, on work on things uh, or problems that would happen, which was a big problem in the past where someone might get injured in the workplace and then they didn't have any way of tracking what farm they were working in. Oh, you know, they were off the books and there was no way of connecting them to that specific farm. Under the Fair Food Program, we've been able to get those farms to directly hire the farm worker and therefore they must incur any medical costs that come but in terms of insurance and retirement no we, we farm workers do not have access to, to those things at least not in our community okay lana you got it okay i'm sorry lana you got a question now go ahead yeah if i may um so uh, uh my first question if i may uh do you have shower in your trailers in the car in those cars do you have showers yeah it's it's nice okay next up uh, i mean can you tell me those workers though like i said like those unions uh, people pay for union you know like in in the big uh, stores like union dudes if if workers pay that's why yeah they pay i mean people workers they pay union like once a week or once every two week because i you know i used to work in jewel and they of course you know they take from the paycheck to the union you know you want or you don't want right so that, that was my question and my third question uh if people sick If people cannot afford the insurance, they don't have insurance. A union also can union help those people uh, with treatment. 
That's what my. You want yeah. me to repeat? I can repeat. If if workers he knows pay, the he, question. No, no I, I get it. Let him answer. If it's me. union, take care of the. Yeah, let him the thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. No, thank you for the question, Elon. I think again that reality is is very different for farm workers. At You all hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Sorry about oh, that. It cut out for a second. Okay, it's probably just the web a little bit. But uh, go ahead and keep Sorry. talking. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry if you're... I'm going to turn off our... Ilana... You may just be experiencing web traffic issues. Go ahead and just cut out your video. It might help. Hello, can you hear us? Yeah, we, we can hear you. Go I ahead. I can hear you. Hey, sorry. Yeah. I think there's there's bad weather where we're, we're at a Democli right now. So I believe that that might have affected the internet. Sorry about that. Um, but Ilana, uh, again, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm sorry that we can't really answer answer the questions because unfortunately the again uh, farm workers in our context aren't allowed aren't able to unionize and therefore farm workers aren't paying any union dues ciw is not a union so we don't get any money or charge farm workers any money a member of ciw or being part of ciw it is open to any farm worker um and and so again in terms of our unions helping with medical resources farm workers are aren't really allowed to unionize in our state. So they aren't getting help. There are programs from, you know, government and nonprofits that want to, that bring medical resources to farm workers. But again, uh, those are very menial and, 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 and they need more robust actual programs for that kind of stuff. So it's very limited in reality. And so uh, again, yeah, that, that's kind of our context here at least. Unfortunately, we, we don't have too much to answer in terms of union, uh, farm worker union, because um, we're not one. Okay, if you don't mind, I would like to ask a question now. Um, you know, you keep talking about the tomato workers and everything else. I'm just wondering if you've seen any of these. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real briefly. Uh, and uh, see if you guys have seen anything like this, the tomato picking machine. And has that made an impact upon your industry? And what are uh, your um, thoughts about it? That's all I'm gonna ask. Okay. Bueno, muy buena pregunta y gracias por preguntar. Uh, sí, exactamente han usado esta máquina especialmente nada más para hacer el ketchup o salsa, ¿verdad? Que es más reconocida de todo Estados Unidos, pero mucho de, uh, hubo varios rancheros que usaron esta máquina, recuerdo, pero dijeron que uh, uh, no les gustaba usar la máquina porque era, mayugaba mucho el tomate para, para, para vender el tomate en el supermercado. Entonces lo dejaron de utilizar, por eso usaron los trabajadores para poder piscar porque eso mayormente dura más el tomate uh, para vender en el supermercado. Pero esas máquinas no lo volvieron a utilizar, sino que sí lo utilizan solamente para hacer la salsa. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, um, Tim. And so thanks for asking it. So those kinds of machines definitely exist in, in the industry. But um, as you were seeing in, in, that, in that video, they're picking the tomatoes red. And that's because most of those kinds of machines are used for the to, for for ketchup, tomato sauces, so more processed um, tomatoes as opposed to field grown tomatoes that you would purchase in a store or in your grocery store in your produce department, right? And so, yeah, those those machines are already up and running and working in that side of the industry, but. Um, and there have been, of course, obviously, you know, innovation and technology isn't stopping. You know, it's trying to get rid of the workforce in some places. But, um, um, but it, they have tried using some of those. But there has been the feedback that they have received is that they are too rough, 
when wow. gathering the tomatoes. And so it, it bruises them and, and, and damages the tomatoes. And the most important thing is when you go to a produce department, what do you want to look for, right? You want to look for a, 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 a you know, produce or tomato that feels firm, that doesn't have a bruise. And so for the most part, that, that, that use of machines hasn't been widespread, widespread in what we call the field grown tomatoes what is used for grocery stores and for sandwiches and such and so so yeah i hope that answers the question no i, I just was curious because i you know I, i've seen um other machines you know like uh do, do the similar things and you know usually it means to better jobs and that kind of thing i mean well i'm a capitalist but you know um i just would like to say thanks for answering the question okay brian you're up next so uh, are there certain chemicals that are negotiated between the farm workers and the farms, like, you know, chemicals, fertilizers or weed killers that they, they don't want to work with, um, that they negotiate as part of their contracts? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Brian. Um, so let me give a little bit of context first to that. So in Immokalee, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were definitely a lot of cases, and you can look up on the, on, on the newspapers and records, of birth defects among farm worker children uh, or, or you know, mothers or who were working in the agriculture industry and were exposed to some of those chemicals and pesticides. And there has been lawsuits and stuff that have been brought up. In the fair food program, yes, part of the agreements is agreements in terms of the health and safety of workers. And so, again, always in, in understanding that it's not static. And, and what I mean by that, it's, you know, just because the latest science on one kind of chemical can be addressed and is, is ever changing. And so, yes, part of it is creating list of chemicals that are safe, not safe, but also creating protocols because we do know that some chemicals are necessary or, or are, are you know, are necessary for the, 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 the production of it. Although there are some organic farms as well, part of the fair food program. And, and there's obviously organic methods, but some in their methods use chemicals. And so it's also not only uh, creating a list of chemicals that are gonna be used and safe to use, but also what are the protocols and actually enforcing those protocols because in the past there were protocols that were being implemented, but farm workers were told, hey, go to the fields and they were spraying a field you were working and sometimes they'd spray the field where you're working at or a neighboring field and some of the air would run off the pesticides to and, and expose you and so yeah if, if a field it has recently been sprayed there's protocol for you know waiting a, a, a specific amount of time to ensure that that has passed and 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 where the proper equipment to actually protect the farm workers so so yes that that's definitely part of the agreements and and for that reason we've seen a significant decrease in those kinds of issues around birth defects and long-term health. Unfortunately, we, you know, it's still really early because some of those chemicals do have long-term health effects. And I think, you know, we're still kind of figuring that out in terms of how that goes. We know, for example, the sugar industry in the, in the city of Belle Glade, there have been a lot and a lot of issues around farm workers getting lung cancer to the exposure of the burning of the sugar cane and, 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 and stuff. But yeah, that, that's kind of what we do, at least under the Fair Food Program. I'm wondering if the farm workers typically work for a certain period of time. I mean, it's very hard labor. And do is it typical for a farm worker to work for 10 or 20 years in this industry? OK, I think he's to trying. You're still muted. Uh, pues sí, gracias por su pregunta. Creo que uh, los trabajadores, dependiendo del tiempo que pueda aguantar, ¿verdad? Porque como de tanto expuesto de lo que son las pesticidas, pues uh, años atrás, como mencionó Uriel, era muy difícil que apenas de un día a otro te pueden meter trabajadores. Ellos sprayaban y metían trabajadores. Entonces, ahí donde los trabajadores se intoxicaban o se envenenaban por el, por el, uh, por estas pesticidas, ¿verdad? Entonces, no dura por muchos años los trabajadores. Pueden fallecer más pronto de lo, de lo normal, pero ahora dentro del programa por comida justa tiene que pasar 72 horas y 
está extrayado o tiene químicos, tiene que pasar esos 72 horas para poder entrar en este, uh, en este rancho o en este campo para poder trabajar y, uh -huh. y sí puede durar y es dependiendo del trabajador si quiere seguir trabajando por muchos años más. Uh -huh. Porque ahora, ahora el cambio, pues eh, lo que tiene los trabajadores ya um, mayores de edad, pues uno ya no puede por la, por la cubeta que pesa, ¿verdad? Entonces ahora mayormente uh, ha sido lo que es el programa que ha traído de parte del gobierno de, de, de Estados Unidos, ¿verdad? que fuerte las leyes, entonces muchos de los rancheros han traído lo que es el H2A y puros jóvenes que han traído aquí y, y pues lo que piden los rancheros presionan un poco más a estos jóvenes que tienen que cumplir con los estándares que piden. Entonces eso es lo que ha hecho esto también de las grandes corporaciones que pide mayormente el tomate y eso es lo que los rancheros también presiona a estos jóvenes de de cumplir con el mayor estándar que piden ellos. Yeah, so Sil Silvia shared a lot and a little bit has to do with what Brian asked earlier um, in terms of pesticides and stuff. Um, so to kind of mention a little bit of that, what Silvia was saying is that there's some even protocols where fields aren't, aren't to be accessed by farm workers until 72 hours after um, the use of a, of a pesticide. And so part of the Fair Food Program is ensuring, again, that those uh, that those regulations are actually being carried out and are actually being followed, right, for the safety of the farm workers. But so that that's what Sylvia was saying. But in terms of your question, Laura, I think, yeah, a hundred percent, it is physically demanding work, and 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 so there is significant turnover in the agricultural industry. Um, uh, and I'm going to add a little bit here as well. Um, Historically, agriculture has been a very discriminatory workplace in terms of usually the workforce is wanted to be people between the ages of 18 to 35 and people want men to do that work. And so older than that age um, and, and, if, and, and, a and if you're a woman, you are discriminated against in the workplace. You don't they don't want you to work in, in, in the industry. Right. And so that's how uh, the, the discrimination would happen in, in, in the past. Under the Fair Food Program, obviously, you're not supposed to be discriminated against regardless of your age and stuff. But uh, as you mentioned, the work naturally, you know, sort of weeds people out. Anyway, it is a physically demanding job and it's not easy for someone who's older to be carrying out these buckets and, and doing this, this physically grueling work until later years of their life. And so people do transition out of that work very often. And as a matter of fact, there's turnover there's significant turnover every year of work of, of farm workers. And for that reason, that's actually one of the main reasons that you see farms uh, advocate or want to get legislation to bring farm workers from other countries, from Mexico and from Guatemala, through what they call an H-2A visa program, which is a temporary status, a temporary worker visa for the agricultural industry. And in that, there's that continued history of discrimination is happening because for the most part, those farms are picking young men between the ages of 18 and 35 and much less women and such. And so, um, yeah, that's that's kind of like like you hinted at, it's very hard to see older farm workers in there and, 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 and for many reasons, both discriminatory and as well as the difficulty of the work. Okay, Charlie, you're next. Yes, um, I, 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 I write union and contracts. Do, do, do you guys, do you guys negotiate industry-wide agreements or do you have written agreements with each grower? Um, and are these like in effect, union contracts are, are like for three year periods generally and our documents that employees are furnished with. Also, uh, how do you enforce it? Follow up, a second question is, how do you enforce Do you have individual or institutional or group grievances, processes, or uh, representatives approach management? How do you enforce, basically, what are your agreements and how do you enforce it? Sure. Um... So, well, part of, well, 
the the first thing in terms of the contracts i'm not too familiar with them personally they have their lawyers because of corporations as well as ciw but they are agreements between the corporations and ciw first and then there's agreements between ciw and the florida tomato growers exchange which represents 90 percent of florida's tomato industry so you could say it's pretty much industry-wide you know nine out of ten farms um, and for the most part, what I do know is that they are evergreen contracts with clauses of, in terms of addressing new in, in incoming issues that pop up in the industry. And there's working groups to do that. And now, Charles, I, I do hope that you were listening to our presentation because I think the Fair Food Standards Council is the, the way that we uh, enforce the Fair Food Program and actually make sure that it's carried out, right? There are investigators, there's you know, they're, they're, the thing is that it's not one way. There's many channels, right? The, age, the education from worker to worker is one thing. Farm workers can go and put a grievance directly with CIW. The, the, they have access to the Fair Food Standards Council who goes and audits their farms. That Fair Food Standards Council has a 24 seven hotline as well that they can call and do so. There are mechanisms with the farms themselves most farm workers naturally don't trust the farms if they are putting a grievance right. And so they have, they have many channels that all lead to either CIW or the Fair Food Standards Council in terms of dealing with those grievances. Uh, the statistic is that most complaints are dealt with in less than two weeks um, if, if any farm worker puts a complaint. And all of the, the statistics in terms of what types of complaints and information, all of that can be accessed. Um, online on the Fair Food Program website.org. There's an annual report that talks about, you know, what kind of issues are farm workers uh, talking about, you know, and so, but that's it. it so it's multi tiered. It's not just one, one solution fits all in terms of how to get, you know, how to actually implement it. There's education, there's the Fair Food Standards, you know, and, and all that stuff. And it's all sort of working together. Thank you. Okay. Um... Who's next with a question? Can I ask him very quick? Yeah, go ahead. Go okay. ahead, Lana. So uh, nobody else is up. Thank you, Miss Sylvia, and thank you, Yurel. Uh, how people pay for food? It's my one question. <laughs> it's like weekly, or I mean, I never, I never even familiar with farm. That's what I'm asking. Uh, it's for education, you know. And my next question, like, like, like you said, like people don't have insurance, but they, I hope they not turn from the hospital those sick people. I hope doctors help them somehow, or or how it's work. That's what my two questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, farm workers, uh, at least under the Fair Food Program, get paid weekly, and so you know, just like everybody else, you know, they make their expenses in terms of you know paying and 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 paying their bills and all that kind of stuff. So it's gonna be very similar to what you're doing in terms of paying for food and and all that stuff. I will mention though that in rural communities there are such things as what we call food deserts, where you know things cost a little bit more. Um, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff and, and, and not necessarily the most healthy food or, or not access to food, foods that are like culturally appropriate, you know, that there's issues like that that happen as well. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, yeah, of course, there are government programs as well as nonprofit organizations that do work to bring about medical resources to Immokalee, but they're limited and, and, and need to be more robust, you know, I think you know, there's, there's just more that needs to be done uh, on that front as well. You know, medical issues in, in this entire country are already a problem and, and much more in a rural community where it's farm workers and, and folks who are temporary and migrant workers and undocumented and such. And so definitely um, more needs to be done there. Are they people, these people pay for, like you have buffet or you have little st uh, uh, stands, like food uh, selling, how people, I mean, how people have lunch, I mean, they're buying food from the stand or they're buying by pound. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> Just like you do. Just like you do. Oh, it's the same in the farm okay thank okay. you thank you so much i would like to ask one more question real quick myself um considering the work you've done what do you think the future is going to hold for the tomato farm workers and uh what 
hope do you have in um, helping them out in the, in, in the future here? El futuro para los trabajadores del tomate. ¿Qué, qué mira usted el futuro? Bueno, pues muchas gracias por la pregunta y muy buena pregunta, ¿verdad? Los trabajadores del tomate, ¿verdad? Que pues nosotros como inmigrantes venimos a trabajar aquí echándole ganas para mantener nuestra familia, porque desafortunadamente nuestro gobierno no, también no nos proveen el trabajo allá, entonces nosotros venimos a trabajar aquí y es lo que han hecho muchos de los trabajadores, ¿verdad? Ver el futuro, pero también como coalición de trabajadores lo que vemos es cambiar vidas, cambiar vidas y aumentar el sueldo de estos trabajadores para que el alcance. Entonces nosotros seguimos trabajando duro y traer otras corporaciones. Uh, uh, más que nada, pues le agradezco a cada uno de ustedes que han estado apoyando, ¿verdad? De la manera en que ustedes hayan podido, porque sin ustedes no podemos seguir apoyando a estos trabajadores y nosotros seguimos trabajando duro para poder uh, cambiar la vida de estos trabajadores que tengan el derecho de reportar cualquier abusos que ellos enfrentan. Yeah. So again, Tim, thanks for the question. Um, you know, for you can a, you can answer this question in so many ways. You know, for the typical farm worker, it's someone who immigrates here because they were looking for another opportunity to come here and work hard, right? You know, it's the typical immigration immigrant story, right? Of someone who came here because they didn't have an opportunity in their home country and came here to, you know, to work hard, to, to look for a better opportunity. Um, and, and so for those farm workers, they're making the, this decision every day, you know, in terms of some of them are continuing in the industry. Some of them move to other places and to work in, construction and landscaping and other places that you know give them more you know more money you know and and, and a better and a, and a better outlook for us as an organization what we want is for there to, to change to continue changing the life of farm workers but for farm workers to be able to say you know i i work in the field and i get you know, and I have my dignity and i'm respected when i do this work and i get paid a fair wage for the work that i do you know, um, and, and, and not a place that farm workers look back and say, I remember that with abuse and I remember not getting paid well when I did that job, you know, changing that dynamic uh, and, and the, that story uh, uh, of, farm work, uh, of, of farm work is what, what we want to do. And the way that we do it is by expanding the Fair Food Program and getting more corporations to understand the responsibility that they have to, to, to the industries and their supply chain and to workers in their supply chains. And so that's what we're going to keep working to do. But again, we can't do that alone. We need to do that with the support of people like you all, people who become more aware of what farm workers face and who are willing to say something about it and to use their voice and to use their dollar and to, you know, again, to, to, to use your platform in whatever way it is, you know, to, to advocate for farm workers who put food on all of our tables. So so that's the future. And I'm going to add something here because it goes with what Lucas, uh, with what Lucas, with what Silvia was saying, which was what one of CIW's founders said and, and, and about, you know, the future. And someone asked him that. And he said, the future for me would be a future where if my son tells me that I want to work in agriculture, I don't feel bad about that decision that I, that I can feel proud and tell them, yeah, go work in agriculture because it's going to be a hard job but it's going to be it's going to be an honest work and and and, and you know you're going to get what you deserve and that's where the future that that we want for farm workers okay now we have three questioners uh bob matter hasn't asked one yet so i'm going to put him next then charlie and then i guess lana's got another one in here so bob go ahead bob you got your yeah go oh, ahead okay so um it, it seems to me like uh, if I was if I was a grower, it would be a good business decision to have that CIW label on my tomatoes because it, at the supermarket, you know, you're going to appeal to to all these uh, mostly you know, I'd say younger people, social justice workers, uh, you know, things like that, people that want a virtue signal. And I'm talking about that's the same crowd that buys fair trade coffee. And I've seen people go absolutely bananas 
over fair trade coffee. That's what they what they want to buy. And the, and the marketers, you know, the coffee companies go way out of their way to really push that, that it's, this is fair trade and shade grown and organic and all that stuff. And then they can charge more money for it too. So I was wondering um, <laughs> um, uh, who, who puts the stickers on and what is the premium? Like if I go to, if I go to Jewel tomorrow and buy a couple pounds of tomatoes, what is the price difference between the ones with the CIW sticker and the ones without? Um, Bob, I think we're on the same page. I think we agree with you, right? That this seems to be like a sound business decision for farmers and, and for corporations in, in, in general, especially as you're saying, right? Consumers are becoming a little more aware and, and, and sometimes even obsess over, you know, wanting to buy, you know, cage free and all that kind of stuff. So we do see that as well. And I think, and I think, you know, uh, understand that, um, that, yeah, it, it does seem to be a good business decision. I would say that that would incentivize them to, to, to want to do this. Right. Um, to us, um, I, one thing that I'll mention is there has been a lot of study lately about whether or not a lot of these so-called labels actually are doing what they purport to do, right? For example, a fair trade um, has been coming under attack lately because um, some of the workers, specifically in Honduras, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, or some of their coffee weren't actually being treated in the way that they said that were being treated, right? And so it has really put that whole um, uh, industry in, in a question mark because people are saying, well, are they actually doing what they're saying? Can we take their word? Or is this just another marketing ploy? And unfortunately, I hate to break it, but we agree with most of the research that is that most of these do tend to be marketing ploys and they don't actually purport to do what they do, right? And, and that's why they are so readily available. And that's why the corporations are so willing to smack it on their label because they know that it actually doesn't uh, require any tangible or concrete change from their end. Um, and so uh, from our end, we, we're much better at creating the system to protect workers than we are at marketing. And so you don't necessarily see the fair food label everywhere. There are some brands like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's that are pushing that label in, 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 their, in their groceries. There is no premium that we um, that we're aware of um, as to buying of uh, uh, you know tomatoes that are that are from the fair food program as opposed to others. Um, that that's really up to the you know the grocery store and and uh, up to them really in terms of how much they're going to put that price and that upcharge. But we do know that, like you said, Bob, most consumers are even really willing to to pay a lot more, you know, and so yeah. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, Tim, I was going to say after Ileana, maybe we should move into uh, rebuttals and thank our speakers. But my question is, okay. I don't believe your organizers from the workforce are under the protection of the National Labor Relations Board. Have there been acts of retaliation or disparate treatment or blacklisting of your organizers or outspoken people in, in the workforce uh, to address issues. Thank you. Yeah, so not, not uh, since we shifted our, our campaign towards targeting the corporations, we haven't seen retaliation. Um, we have seen, uh, well, actually, let me, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll take a step back. There has been steps done by certain corporations to undermine the organizing, but more of the solidarity organizing. So what I mean is, and you don't have to take my word for this again, there's a New York uh, Times article during our Burger King campaign uh, where the article is called Burger with a Side of Spies. <laughs> and you can look this up. And, and the article is about how Burger King uh, hired private investigators to infiltrate some of the students and organizing that was being done to try to pressure Burger King in certain campus locations, and they were hired um, by um, 
by uh, by Burger King to try to get information on what was happening on the ground. And so you can look that up. Burger with a side of spies is the name of the article. Um, so it's a good, it's a good read. Um, yeah, hear the yeah the giggles. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, there has also been um, some in instances where we have had nuns um, who have been hired um, to, to say that no farm workers are being treated with respect in this community. Look, um, so there was an organization that purported to sort of help farm workers. McDonald's did that during their campaign. And then it was found out that, you know, McDonald's was donating to her organization in some way and capacity. And so, 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 uh, so in other words, I, I can't say that there hasn't been retaliation because there actually has been some sort of retaliation to try to undermine the organizing. Um, back to the Burger King campaign. Uh, and, and this is in the early years of YouTube. Um, it seemed that the one of the CEO or higher ups of Burger King was using their daughter's YouTube page to put uh, comments on CIW videos mentioning how this was complete lie and stuff. And then it, they were able to trace the account and found out that it was someone who was uh, close to an executive position or if not in an executive position um using this and, and pretending to be you know uh using sort of a, a pseudo account um to do this kind of uh you know line uh so there has been and then in the in the past when ciw was very much focused on the growers mm -hmm. yeah um you know sometimes when they were trying to leave delegations at some of the farms some workers got fired they would call the police on them and all that kind of stuff so yeah yeah there's there's a long history uh, of of you know uh, of there being some sort of retaliation to people who have who have supported this movement. Thank you. And now the corporations that come on board are you? Hey, Laura, Laura, Lana's next, and then we'll get you next, okay? And then we'll, you'll okay, have the no last problem. question. Lana, you have another question, and then we'll go uh, back to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, you. Thank you, Miss Sylvia. Uh, very quick two questions. Uh, why, my first question, why you decided to go to this field, you know, uh, in this farm field, why you decided? And my next question, are you by any chance never came to Illinois, like for farmer markets? Because people sometimes like to buy, you know, like fresh stuff. And it's reasonable, especially, you know, when season, you know, after harvest tomatoes, you know, strawberries, so I may be difficult with the, the transfer to, you know, it costs, you know, I know it's cost dinero, <laughs> it costs money. But anyhow, uh, are you by any chance, did you ever came to Illinois for farmer market? You did? And where? I would like to know. And if you can come maybe to the north side, if you would like to come. If it's not, then answer my question. <laughs> my two questions to Pregunta. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Why you decided to go to, to this show? <laughs> bueno, gracias y qué bueno uh, pregunta gracias. que tiene. Uh, pues uh, mi decisión no fue que yo quise venir a trabajar en, en los campos, ¿verdad? Uh, pues yo llegando acá a veces nos prometen que eh, aquí en los Estados Unidos se gana buen dinero, ¿verdad? Pero uno viene con esos sueños de trabajar algún, a, algún trabajo que no vas a enfrentar en ninguna situación que te estén acostando en los campos. Desafortunadamente yo caí a trabajar en los campos. Eh, llegué en un campo de puros trabajadores que estaba muy aislado. Uh, eran como 15, 20 minutos para llegar en el pueblo. Uh, uh, incluso yo tuve miedo de llegar en esos, en esos campos porque llegué uh, en un campo de puros trabajadores y llegué ahí a trabajar en el campo para llevar el sustento, la comida de mi familia allá en México, que desafortunadamente casi no teníamos para comer. Entonces, esa fue la razón que me llevó a trabajar en los campos y duré por muchos años. Aprendí muchísimo de trabajar en los campos. Yo personalmente, yo lloraba cuando en las primeras uh, semanas que yo empecé a trabajar en los campos porque no sabía el trabajo. Era muy chica. Pero ahora aprendí mucho, 
aprendí mucho a uh, una experiencia que yo he llevado a pesar de la situación que nos trataban los contratistas para poder llegar a esta, esta vida donde ahora estoy, ¿verdad? Pero gracias por la pregunta. Yeah. So to answer your question, um, so thanks again for the question. So Silvia was saying is, you know, like most people that immigrate to the United States, you know, you come here looking for an opportunity, but you're not necessarily thinking that you're going to face abuse and you're going to get mistreated or you're not going to get paid very little, right? Um, and how the opportunities aren't necessarily sitting there waiting for you, right, <laughs> to arrive and just take them. And so most people that work in agriculture work there because they either have a background working in agriculture in their home country or because that's one of the only opportunities available to them, right? And so Silvia was saying that she was more around that, which was, it was one of the only opportunities available to her. And so she had never worked in agriculture before. And when she started working, she was a little fearful because most of her crew were men and her, her supervisor was men and crew leader were, were men. And it was very isolated, it's isolating to work in the fields. Um, and so often she was sharing that at night, you know, she would cry because she was very young and, and didn't know, didn't have the skill to, to do this kind of work very quickly. And, and so, you know, she, you know, they would often push her to do that stuff, but through working there, she has learned and, and learned, you know, how to do that work and, 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 and learn also to then get involved with this group and advocate for herself and, and sort of the needs that farm workers face. And so that's why she got involved. Um, With, with, with this, you know, as, as an agricultural worker because, because of the need. Um, how, are you, how are you doing guys now? How is it going? Because it's winter. Ah, it's warmer in Florida. Okay, okay. And, and very quick, do you have websites so perhaps we can, people can... Um, yeah, all right. Lord, okay. Uh, Lana, let's, let's just answer the question and we're going to have to cut Lana off. Now, Laura had a question. No, don't cut Jake me had off. one more and then at the end of Jake's the last question. If I, if I can, I can answer. I don't really have a question anymore, but I just wanted to thank you for this thank presentation. You. And like the work you do is so important. Right. right. Um, you're protecting the most vulnerable people in, in our communities. And it's just really, really incredible work. And I think reaching out also to younger people, um, the younger generation is really conscious about what they eat and where it comes from. And I think just educating, you know, you have college kids who are obviously on board, even younger kids who, um, who could be told about this in you know, elementary school age kids who are gonna tell their parents, hey, I don't wanna eat at Wendy's because they're not supporting these farm workers. Um, okay. So I think getting that reach to younger and younger people is, is um, is something that you probably are already aware that's really important, but okay. it's just really incredible work that you're doing. All right, uh, Jake, your last question. Okay, my question is: you, you, you said that, um, you said that a certain per, a certain percentage of the farm workers, uh, well, there's a, you said there's a program within your organization to, um, to seek citizenship. For uh, for farm workers, I would wonder what percentage of the farm workers in Florida are non-citizens, and of those, what percentage of uh, of the farm workers in Florida are here illegally? And if so, um, isn't that a detriment? Isn't doesn't that become a detriment to unionizing them? Yeah. Um... So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I, I can answer this one. I'm not sure where you heard about our citizenship stuff. I, I was mentioning mostly that the UFW was working on, on citizenship. That's the United Farm Workers based out of California. We, again, okay. are okay. engaged oh, okay. the farm in workers, legislative okay. efforts. Yeah, the, they're, they're a separate group, they're more known, you know, the right. uh, Cesar right, Chavez. Right, right. And stuff. Yeah, right, so right, we, right. we're not ourselves working on that. Um, We don't have statistics on citizenship and, and undocumented and visa workers. We don't do that. We're not in a business. We don't care about that. Um, under the Fair Food Program, um, if you're a citizen, if you're a visa worker, if you're undocumented, your, your, your human rights shouldn't be 
stepped on and infringed on. And so that's how we view it. That's the outlook that we take. And so we don't really take statistics on, on percentages of who's undocumented, who isn't. Okay. There is a difficulty, I would add, but it doesn't come from the undocumented element. It would come from the more uh, just the, the, the uh, turnover that happens in agriculture in terms of being able right. to organize. I imagine right. that that would be a difficulty in unionizing as well. But in our organizing, it is difficult because you have new farm workers coming in all the time who don't know the lay of the land and you have to educate them about okay. what's happening and, and the problems and, and get them involved. Right. And so that's where it does become a little bit difficult, but not necessarily because of their status. Tim, could I answer that? Um, the labor laws of the United States don't distinguish between whether you're a citizen or illegal and, and citizenship. The NLRB will do not differentiate. Labor laws are labor laws as long as you're an employee and there's no, no criteria that okay. is applied in the enforcement of the labor laws. They don't distinguish into categories in any fashion. Okay. With that, uh, let's, let's you know, can you give okay. that so, Anna, we're going to move on to rebuttals now, okay? Okay, but wait, wait, wait. I just want to I just want I just want to add to that quickly. It used to be that the unions would frown on on uh, workers who are here illegally, including by the way, Cesar Chavez because they tend to depress wages. Okay, anyway, like I said, let's move on to rebuttals now. Just like our speakers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, again, Tim, it's not polite from you. I, I, I would like us to... Eliana, please, let's... Do say you that. have website? People Tim. can write to you and ask well, questions. Lana. You know, can you give website or email? Tim. What, Charlie? Can't you silence her? Tim, you okay, have to be quiet and not interrupt people, Tim. It's not okay, let's, 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 Okay, Brian, I know you got something inside of you, I'm sure. Uh, is that it? Just Charlie speaking tonight? Bob, how about you? Uh, I, I might be able to think of something later. I don't have anything in my head right now, really. Okay, uh, I'll put you down. All right, yeah, put, put me down after Charlie. You know, can you give kindly uh, your reachable email or website, please? Okay, thank you. Oh, well, we'll put it in the Thank chat, you. Lana. So Charlie, Bob, uh, Charlie, Brian, and then Bob Matter. All right, who else? So we only got three people to start. Um, okay, I'm not going to make a rebuttal tonight because I've been, uh, uh, you know, I, I would I'll probably go off the deep end if I do. Ellen Corley, I know you got something to say all the time. Why don't you... Uh, Sign up for a rebuttal tonight. I guess she's not there. Ernie and Jan, I know you always got something to say, so come on in. All right. Um, since there's so few rebuttals, I'll extend the time to five minutes each. I got a speaker here. Charlie, you're going first, and Brian, then Bob Matter. So, Charlie, go ahead. Okay. Again, I'd like to thank both of our speakers for their presentations this evening, as well as their contribution to the organized labor movement, uh, which is a difficult area in which to operate on occasion. I noticed Tim did two minutes of internet research and he thought he knew something about harvesting tomatoes. I've actually seen those operations in California. Uh, those are bulk harvesters and they, they deposit the tomatoes in the fiberglass containers on flatbed trucks because the tomatoes get all crushed up. That's a totally different kind of operation. There's even a science of the type of tomatoes. Oddly enough, the type of tomato that lends itself to uh, mechanical harvesting is not the type that the industry wants. That's the problem they, they, they run into. But then again, that shows you the shortcoming of two minutes one minute 
internet research. Okay, I was involved a good deal uh, with the United Farm Workers in the strawberry campaign. I actually was cleaning out my office the other day and I came across a bag of boycott grape uh, pins. But in regarding strawberries, what would happen is they, in kind of California laws, they could have votes to organize a union. And if the employees at a, at a grower, an operation voted to have a union, the next day, the capitalist growers would plow under the entire crop so that there was nothing to harvest. That shows you what free, that's free market capitalism. For we'll show you, you might have a union. They would plow under the entire crop and write off the season as a loss. Um, the uh, other thing is I still keep up with it. If you go in the supermarkets, it's, the strawberries come out of Watsonville and there was some action regarding Driscoll strawberries. I still look at it to see what they're going on. I actually was involved in a demonstration at a Wendy's here in Chicago, one of the first at the beginning of the Fight for 15 movement. We shut down the, the Wendy's on Clark Street across from the First National Bank. Yeah, shut them down if they don't wanna, don't wanna do it. I recommend that the you guys do what Wobblies do at these places. We would go into a, a fast food place or a coffee shop. Everybody would buy the minimum, like a little minimum cup of coffee and occupy all the seats. And every now and then we'd sing a song like Solid, Solidarity Air Forever and there were no seats for any of the customers. Slight inconvenience. Sorry about that folks. But uh, I still occasion write Wendy's and tell them to get their act together and post things on my various labor-oriented Facebook pages. Keep up the good work, and I appreciate what you're doing, and you will prevail, I assure you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Brian, are you ready to go now? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that um, it sounds like the problem here is the government, that the National Labor Relations Act doesn't allow farm workers to unionize and that affects their ability to bargain collectively. So, I mean, big time, right? It prevents them from bargaining collectively. So it seems to me that the problem, once again, is your beloved government, Charlie. All right, is, is that it? Yep, that's okay, it. Our speakers have indicated that they wanna leave in about 10 minutes or so, and I wanna give them a final chance to rebut so brian if you're ready uh you already got okay bob let's get you in and then okay. we'll, give our, we'll give our speakers a chance to rebut okay everyone. um so it, as everybody most people know here that i i'm generally not a a big fan of unions because unions uh, really is it's it's a privilege and uh you know i'm generally against privilege um that privilege is really the source of inequality and wealth. Um, however, um, this, the CIW organization doesn't have that coercive power because most unions, you know, they use, you know, it's coercion or the, the, the uh, owner, you know, the business owners must, you know, negotiate with the union. You know, they, you know, they, if they sign so many union cards, that's it. There's a contract. You know they have to, they have to settle with. You know they have to negotiate with them. Um, but with the with the CIW, it's it's not really a union. I kind of look at it as more of a of a marketing thing, kind of a voluntary thing, uh, which is I don't think necessarily a bad thing. And like I mentioned, you know those uh, I've seen the uh, you know the, the fair trade coffee, and I've been to numerous you know, trade shows and events and things where I've seen booths uh, of people selling the, uh, you know, like fair trade coffee. And there's always a big line of people buying it. And, you know, people really go out of their way to, to try to buy that stuff. You know, consumer, that does mean a lot to consumers. Now, not so much to me really anymore. I want, I want 
cheap food and lots of it. And I don't care if it was picked by kids or if the animals were mistreated or anything like that. I want, I said, I want cheap food and lots of it. But, uh, but, there are, but there are a lot of people, though, especially, like I said, you know, young people now that are really taking far more interest in their food than people, you know, my generation did. Uh, and they want to buy it. They want to buy the fair trade, cage free, you know, uh, free roaming chickens and all that, you know, all that organic and, and all that stuff. So uh, anyway, so I don't think that's necessarily a, a bad thing. And, it, you know, it does offer some, you know, it does, you know, apparently, you know, do some good. Now, um, uh, I hear that I heard this occasionally, I hear this, these talks, you know, peppered with talks about sexual mistreatment of workers. And I'm always kind of confused by that because there are regular state laws against sexual assault. And I'm wondering, like, why, why doesn't someone just go file a report against uh, an employer or something for if it's an employer doing it or if it's a coworker or whatever? There's already there's already legal avenues in place uh, for handling uh, sexual assault, so maybe that that could be handled. Uh, and see, so, you know, I'm kind of meandering. I got other things. Oh, I put a, put a note over here in, in the chat that in 1960, Edward Murrow did a, uh, a story on the, uh, the that Immokalee region down there, and uh, it was called "Harvest of Shame." And it is available for free on YouTube. I've not watched it. Now I think I'll go watch it and and, uh, and see what it's about. And there was even a, a follow up on it, uh, so that that's out there. And um, another thing that ran across my mind was uh, uh, I was just wondering. You know, we have like so many uh, young, you know, healthy men in prison. Uh, you know, I, I wonder why. You know. Maybe uh, maybe we should be employing them as as labor, the the ones that you know you don't have to be uh, you know not axe murderers or things like that, but you know people that are in for the lesser crimes. Let's say drunk driving, for instance. You know, drunk driving, things like that. Uh, you know, theft, burglaries. You know, things like that. Maybe we should get some of these people working on these farms because that is backbreaking that is hard labor and uh and maybe uh, six months of picking tomatoes and they could maybe pay some restitution to the victims and then maybe put a little money aside like you know maybe keep half and put half away to pay their victims back or something uh that might be a uh, uh, a little bit of an incentive not to go into crime anymore are you uh, advocating a chain gang Yes. Okay. That's, as, as a form of uh, that's rehabilitation, Charlie. Okay. Uh, these people before, why, before we... why should they sit in a jail cell <laughs> playing video games all day, surfing the internet and reading Shakespeare when they could be earning some money to pay back their victims? Be, before we doing... go... Okay. Before <laughs> yeah. we go down this rabbit hole, our speakers have got like maybe six or seven minutes left before they have to log off, according to them. So we'll give you guys a last word and then we'll stop the recording and we can continue this rat hole after the, after the, uh, this, after the record, after our formal program. So go ahead. You guys get the last word. Yeah. Well, on behalf of Sylvia and myself, thank you all so much for giving us the time uh, to just, you know, share a little bit about our work and, and, you know, uh, just hear us out about the work that we do here with the coalition. Uh, I'm going to be, mostly commenting on what was said some things i'm going to ignore because uh well i think any reasonable person would ignore them but um you know i appreciate uh what, what you mentioned charles and the support brian i agree with you i think government failure of government has failed workers in the united states um and the main reason is because government doesn't work for workers it works for certain corporations and such and so Unions have been uh, what a very powerful tool that have been for the most part disarmed, um, and 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 sort of and and I think that our I, I so I agree with what you're saying um, in terms of of that I think the CIW exists as sort of this pseudo pseudo labor 
method of addressing a need that is there, which is a need to eliminate issues that farm workers are facing in, in, in a context where uh, there isn't a really clear cut solution on how to address those issues. And so I, I do believe that that's why this is a, a bit innovative. Um, and Bob, you know, I, you started off so well and then you went so badly. Um, how could you mention that you, <laughs> how, how could you, how could you mention that unions, you know, promote privilege and can be oh. coercive and then literally go on to uh, be okay with so many of the worst coercive elements of society, which is prisons. And what about the coercion that, you know, corporations do to make that child get the produce that you so happily want? You know, what about that coercion? I guess consistency might seems like you need to get consistent in your philosophy a little bit. Um, but yeah, but other than that, I just, you know, appreciate the opportunity and, you know, for us to share the work that we do. Um, if you want to learn more about the work that, that we do, I can share uh, our website with, with you, Charles, and you can share it with whoever wants it. Um, but again, um, it, it's been through the support uh, of individuals who at least give us the chance to, uh, you know, hear about what farm workers say and, and have a heart and say, well, I don't want to consume produce or food that comes from a place where people are being exploited. And, and, and that's what's been able to create the change that we've been able to do. So thank you all so much for the time. Um, and, and yeah, we hope to connect again in the future. Come again sometime. Thank you. Love right. you. There are links on the January uh, College Complex site to the to the Facebook and all that. Okay, then. At this point, I'll declare the College of Complex is adjourned. If you guys would like to stay on board for a little bit of after chat, please do so. Again, we'll see all of you next week. <laughs>